I was never formerly a student of George Mossy, but I was his young colleague, admirer, and I dare say his friend during his annual visits to Cornell University through the 1990s. Year after year, George was lodged in extremely primitive guest quarters, a predicament to which we rea he reacted with the quip, when you've been to English boarding school, you can get used to anything. In his guest lectures and our courses, he loved most to provoke. I recall best two of his provocations. Have you ever noticed, he would ask a room full of late and anxious teenagers, that gay porn stars have no body hair? If that question had a pedagogical context, I don't remember it. And second, quote, from the vantage point of the fin du siècle, i.e. 1900, which country would have been imagined as the one most capable of carrying out a genocide of the Jews, end quote? The answer, France. My paper today begins in a conventional disagreement with this provocation. It answers Germany, but proceeds in an unconventional understanding of the longue durée of the anti-Semitism that metastasized into genocide, and which is again of political relevance today. I want to place in discussion a broad hypothesis about the propulsion, the political libido, so to speak, of anti-Semitism in Germany in and after 1870, and the question of the forms of its resurgence today. I was bold enough to state this hypothesis on the opening page of my recent book, The Trouble with Wagner, without really accounting for it or supporting it. I asserted there that the, quote, the perfect political storm of anti-Semitism can be understood as a displacement of suppressed intra-Christian difference, end quote. Nineteenth century Germany's project of nationalization and this project's requirement of the suppression of religious or confessional difference, despite the latter's multiple displacements by energies of secularization, resulted, I contend, in the propulsion of anti-Semitism as an animus displaced from the abiding anxieties of intra-Christian difference. The more secularized these differences, the more submerged, indeed suppressed, they became. Moreover, the question of today's resurgence of anti-Semitism in the context of the rise of European and global populisms, xenophobias, and racisms lends itself to similar, although unpredictable, structural analysis. <clears throat> Broadly speaking, I would historicize this phenomenon in two periods, the period of primary displacement involving the war against the Jews until 1945, and the period of secondary displacement involving the politics of the rhetoric the rhetorical weaponization, so to speak, of anti-Semitism and its relevance to debates about the role of Israel, Islam, anti-Semitism, philo-Semitism, and Islamophobia in German public discourse today, or after 1945. Speaking of philo-Semitism, the imbrication, the Gordian knot of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel discourse has been clearly doubled by the partnership of philo-Semitism and pro-Israel sentiment, as evident, you may have noticed, in last Saturday's demonstration for Israel and against the Al-Quds Day initiative. The point, of course, being the dubious structure of philo-Semitism to begin with. I want to share two stories, a personal, uh, not about me, but a personal and obscure anecdote from 2002, followed by a canonic text from 1850. Number one, Bavaria, autumn 2002. A German physician who had grown up in a secular Protestant family in the environs of Munich sought out a favorite local country chapel in which to hold his marriage ceremony. Earlier that year, he and his wife, the daughter of observant Hindu parents in southern India, had undergone a three-day Hindu marriage ritual in her ancestral village. Now, the country priest in Bavaria refused to grant the venue. When pressed for a reason, in other words, when interrogated for a suspected diagnosis of racism, the priest looked the groom searingly in the eye and said, quote, she is not the problem, you are. Let's assume that both members of the couple, the Protestant Bavarian and the Hindu Indian Canadian, were in fact the problem that both were out of place to channel the title of Edward Said's memoir, in the location to which the groom was sentimentally attached. A double displacement may be at work here, 
First, the more expected displacement of historic racialized anti-Semitism from a Jewish target to a Hindu one with an implied cross-reference to Muslims or others considered of color and hence foreign uh, as contingent on political moods in Germany or precisely in, more precisely in Bavaria circa 2002. And second, the displacement of the core issue, Catholic Protestant alienation onto a third target, once Jewish, now Muslim, or in the case of the anecdote, Hindu. But the Bavarian country priest's guileless disclosure brings to the surface the submerged truth that among these varied politics of difference and exclusion, the problem was the groom's Protestantism. Story number two. Lohengrin, text and music by Richard Wagner, 1845 to 1850. As I've already indicated, and as many of you know, I have long considered the works of Richard Wagner to be unique foundations of the affective and ideological worlds of modern Germany. George Mossy acknowledged this conviction, but wasn't interested himself. I expect something similar from many of you, I guess. My own teacher, Karl Shorsky, was interested, and in this respect, uh, more generally, the mossy shorsky dialectic within the politics of cultural historiography is worth considering. Shorsky and Mossy both wrote political history through cultural lenses. Mossy's methodological old-fashionedness may be defined by his tendency to survey cultural documents rather than dip deeply into them. Shorsky does dip, he reads more deeply, not as some of his students claim in a post-linguistic turn avant la lettre, but rather through his own linguistic performance toward the discovery of both conscious and unconscious links between cultural and aesthetic performances and political transformations. The story of Lohengrin involves King Henry Heinrich of Saxony, 1919 to 936, who was, quote, an energetic, quoting Ernest Newman, an energetic upholder of German rights and a fighter for German unity, features that commend him to the affections of Germans of our own epoch. He set his face against the pretension of the Roman church to interfere in German politics. When a truce with the Hungarians expired in 933, he developed a new system of, quote, national defense and led an army to victory. This is the explicit frame, often neglected, of the plot of Wagner's Lohengrin, which opens which, with King Heinrich adjudicating a local dispute in Antwerp in the Duchy of Brabant, where he has come to recruit soldiers for his eastern front. And you know about Elsa, uh, the soprano who stands accused of the murder of her brother. In a dream, she calls a white knight, and that white knight appears as Lohengrin riding a swan on the banks of the river. And if you're an opera fan, you know the various jokes about the swan. Now, the Lutheran mid-19th century would, would have projected proto-reformation to say nothing of proto-nationalist momentum into the king's maneuvers. So much is clear. In addition, 19th century audiences might well have recognized in Lohengrin's swan a principal symbol of Luther himself and the coming of the Reformation. The symbol of the Luther swan likely originates in the story about Jan Hus, the Czech reformer burned at the stake in 1415. At his execution, he is reported to have exclaimed, you are now going to burn a goose, Hus, Bohemian for goose, but in the century you will have a swan which you can neither roast nor boil. And on the night prior to October 31st, 1517, Elector Friedrich of Saxony is said to have reported a dream of a priest who wrote on the doors of the Wittenberg Cathedral uh, with a large pen that had belonged to a goose of, Bo of Bohemia. The recent exhibition here in Berlin, uh, in fact, uh, sponsored by the uh, DHM, uh, the Luther Effect Protestantism 500 Years in the World, displayed a weather vane from the Evangelical Reformed Church in Grothusen on the North Sea coast from 1597 in the form of a golden uh, copper gilded Luther swan. If the hero Lohengrin arrives on a Luther swan, his intervention in largely Catholic Brabant, in a, obviously in a post-Reformation uh, um, um, uh, um, um, sense, follows the story of a German nationalization qua Lutheranization. He then wraps himself into a decidedly Jewish trope, uh, 
I will get your job done, he offers. Don't ask me for my name or where I come from. The intervention fails, and fails in a way that Wagner is unable either to narrate or to control. And I would contend that uh, this uh, finale is in fact unstageable. The breakdown of the plot is unstageable, uh, which is symptomatic of the kind of problem at stake. The long-term effect of 19th century German Protestant assumptions has been attended to recently by scholars of the grand narrative of secularization, perhaps most notably Talal Assad. Assad's broad critique holds the largely Hegelian world history paradigm and its legacy in the professionalization of historiography in the German 19th century. Uh, uh, though the more specific paths of German historiography are not central to Assad's and others' more general intervention, their critique is nonetheless illuminating uh, in this uh, context. As a national and indeed nation-building project, German historiography at mid-century and after told a nation-building story uh, with significant variations pertinent to its political telos. For all their important differences, however, national and nationalizing narratives, whether intentionally or functionally, and as George often said, the answer is of course both, at once perform and repress what I would insist remains the schism between Protestant and Catholic Germany. Now, the historiography of anti-Semitism tends to follow variations of a unified chronology presenting along the way very little typological or national differentiation. Such is the case with Leon Polyakov's four-volume history of anti-Semitism, uh, divided into sequence, of which the last one is, uh, has the most interesting title, and that is Suicidal Europe, 1870 to 1933. Gavin Langmuir's History, Religion, and Antisemitism and the uh, successor volume toward a definition of antisemitism have a medieval focus and argue for the difference between anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. Of particular relevance to my argument here is the chapter on, quote, doubt in Christendom. Self-doubt, as well as the doubt of others, formed the pressure, he writes, that led to, quote, the division of Christianity into different religions, and most tragically, in the persecution of those considered heretic and of Jews, end quote. Most recently, and in this context perhaps most disappointingly, David Nirenberg's Anti-Judaism, the Western Tradition, combines the episodic with the generalizing, avoiding the distinction, not dissecting it, between anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. That said, Nirenberg does offer several incisive observations describing anti-Judaism as essential to Western, i.e. Christian, thinking about itself. His chapter on, quote, Reformation and, and its consequences flags the importance of what he calls Jewish weapons in Christian wars, uh, in which, and I quote, the conflict between rival visions of Christianity assumed the shape of a struggle against Judaism, end quote. Hannah Arendt, in the 1953 reply to Eric Vergelin's review of the origins of totalitarianism, writes a fairly long quote, the reason why this whole literature on the history of anti-Semitism is so extraordinarily poor in terms of scholarship is that the historians, if they were not conscious anti-Semites, which of course they never were, had to write the history of a subject which they did not want to conserve. They had to write in a destructive way and to write history for purposes of destruction. Uh, and to write history for purposes of destruction is somehow a contradiction in terms. I, Arendt, did not write a history of anti-Semitism or imperialism, but analyzed the elements of Jew hatred and the element of expansion insofar as these elements were still clearly visible and played a decisive role in the totalitarian phenomenon itself. The book, therefore, continuing Arendt, does not really deal with the origins of totalitarianism, as its title unfortunately claims, but gives a historical account of the elements which crystallized into totalitarianism. Like Arendt's account before him and Hans Blumenberg's after him, Sigmund Freud's late account begins with the paradox of the numerical insignificance of the Jews. Moses and monotheism, quote, whence did this tiny and impotent nation derive the authority to pass themselves off as the favored child of the sovereign lord? And then he follows 
on the origins of modern anti-Semitism, quote, then there is lastly the most recent motive of the series. We must not forget that all the peoples who now excel in the practice of anti-Semitism became Christians only relatively in recent times, sometimes forced to it by bloody compulsion. One might say they are all badly christened. Under the thin veneer of Christianity, they have remained what their ancestors were, barbarically polytheistic. They have not yet overcome their grudge against the new religion which was forced on them, and they have projected it, they have projected it onto the source from which Christianity came to them, the facts that the Gospels tell a story which is enacted among Jews and in truth treats only Jews has facilitated such a projection. The hatred for Judaism is at bottom a hatred for Christianity, and it is not surprising that in the German Nationalist Socialist Revolution, this close connection of the two monotheistic religions finds such clear expression in the hostile treatment of both. Thus, for Freud, anti-Semitism is a, as a projection of Christian anxiety. What Freud neglects here is the difference, the difference between Christian anxiety and intra, or rather, inter-Christian anxiety, in other words, Catholic Protestant anxiety. But this is the fissure in which, with, with which he is most concerned during this time, during the period of the writing of Moses and monotheism, and makes direct reference to it. Freud's hesitation to publish even the first part of the book in Austria resulted from his view that Catholic authority controlled cultural norms there, that the publication of the book would unleash a potentially fatal attack on the surviving psychoanalysis. As the best known and perhaps the longest lived example of his generation of Austrian Jews who converted neither to Catholicism nor to Protestantism, Freud's position here and in general might still be described as that of an Austrian variant of the Jewish Protestant symbiosis of the German Enlightenment and after. Finally, in 2018 and beyond, mainstream German discourse seems to me to be stuck in energies of displacement and projection. The May 2019 Bundestag resolution condemning the BDS movement rests, it seems to me, on two basic errors, the equation of the movement with anti-Semitism and the claim that it targets individuals. The Bundestag resolution seems confused, the product of a kind of entrapment between two taboos. On the one hand, the taboo of anti-Semitism producing a kind of overcompensation at the least and perhaps a kind of emotional cover-up at the more extreme level. On the other hand, a taboo against boycotts and particularly, and understandably, a boycott against Jews whose rhetoric and reality recalls Nazi boycotts of Jews and their businesses. It is not unreasonable to ask whether the fear of anti-Semitism is a form of anti-Semitism itself. Similarly, a symptomatic and, to my uh, view, very underinformed New York Times feature article by James Angelus called, quote, the new anti-Semitism for the nation's estimated 200,000 Jews, new forms of old hatreds are stoking fear from May 19th of this year, repeats disputed anecdotes about anti-Semitic attacks. At the same time, Said Achan and Katarina Galore show in their forthcoming ethnography, The Moral Triangle, Germans, Israelis, Palestinians, Young Israelis and Palestinians in Berlin, how they show young Israelis and Palestinians in Berlin deploying new neighborhoods, new sociabilities, and the varied languages of art and sexuality to break through sclerotic mainstream positions and discourses. Finally, in the context of populisms and our own fears, we have to reckon with the atavism into which the United States have fallen. Anti-Catholicism in the US receded in the 1960s to be displaced by a color racism that has only intensified as civil rights legislation suppressed it. That suppression has now been lifted by the dominant political right with anti-Semitism, I would contend, available as a supplement to racism. The abiding paradigm of Charlottesville 2017 was fueled by racism and supplemented by anti-Semitism. Donald Trump's assertion that there were, quote, decent people on both sides has, uh, for the present moment, ratified not only cultural hatred, but murder. Thank you.